Let's start off by talking about art. Okay. Do you like art? Growing up, uh, a way to express myself and uh, just generally showing my emotions through whatever medium that I, cho I choose. Um, I actually prefer art more than music in some uh, different ways. I like to paint and I like to, I like to see people, how they express themselves as well uh, through their art. Um, so yeah, I do love art. Do you think that art classes are important in school? I actually feel like art is very subjective. Um, teaching basic theories about art and stuff like that, I feel like, yes, it is sometimes necessary so people can understand, let's say, basic concepts such as color theory and whatnot. However, I don't feel like um, following a certain um, concept or how to draw this or how to draw that um, is quite necessary. Like, I feel like your own creative mind can go in whatever direction you want it to go to. Who are your favorite artists? So my favorite artist in terms of uh, the music industry, I would say Rihanna. I love her music. I love, like every time I put it on um, uh, my car and I'm driving, I just love listening to her music because it, it literally changes my mood. Um, and I love listening. I love sharing that experience with my friends as well. So it, she's <laughs> tops uh, my favorite artists. Now let's talk about animals. Do you have a pet at home? I actually have two pets. Um, they're both cats. I love animals, but specifically cats. I love um, everything about them. So I have two cats. One, her name is Nuni. The other is Tuti. <laughs> um, and Nuni kind of describes me as a person. Like we kind of share the same... Um, behaviors so she's very uh lazy sometimes she's also um introverted i would say i really love cats i love how fluffy and sometimes friendly they are i also enjoy their company just them being there would you like a different pet in the future so i used to have ducks um two ducks and I, unfortunately, I had to give them up to um, shelter because I felt like I couldn't um, properly take care of them in my house. So in the future, I really hope that I could um, revisit that memory of them, of taking care, care of my ducks. So hopefully in the near future, maybe if I'm fully settled in my own house, I would love to have two more ducks. <laughs> And do you prefer cats or dogs? Definitely cats. <laughs> like, I think it's because I'm, uh, I come from like a Muslim family. So we kind of have like a taboo or like an idea of dogs. Like not, it's not clean. It's not, you know. Um, so cats are just the way to go. Like I love cats, <laughs> their personality, the way they look, the way they act, everything about them. Now let's talk about reading. How often do you read books? Back in middle school, I used to be so into books. It was basically my personality trait. I really, really enjoyed, like I had my alone time is just spending um, my time reading books. And at one point, my family just told me like, get out of the house, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and even if I did go out of the house, like I would just carry my book everywhere I go. As of recently, I kind of fell off of that habit of reading constantly because just with everything happening in my life, I can't keep up. But um, I would say once every two months, I, I would read books. <laughs> what book would you recommend to a friend? So I would recommend All the Bright Places. I forgot the name of the author. But I think that book really depicts what a teenager would go through. Like I said, I used to read back in middle school and also in high school. So I felt like that book really spoke to me. I really related to that book. And I would recommend it to a friend because I generally feel like 
it kind of relates to, you know, the adolescents or teenagers in general. Do you prefer to read ebooks or paper books? I generally prefer uh, physical hard or hard copies because I like the feel of the book being in my hand, um, especially because I use my phone daily for a lot of things. I would like to change up my routine every once in a while. So a hard copy would feel like it's a different vibe um, to my daily routine. Now let's talk about photography. Who do you normally take photos of? Whenever I go out or step out of, outside the house, I love taking pictures of whether it's of my friends, my family members, or cats. <laughs> I actually enjoy looking at things from a different perspective. So let's say just like the book on the table or the light or even just a bird from afar, I like taking pictures to show people like through my eyes what I see or how I view the world. Do you ever put any of your photos in frames? I've actually never thought about that. I've never done that before. It's actually interesting because I've seen a lot of people do that online where they print out their Polaroid pictures or like a physical copy of pictures that they've taken before and they framed it. And actually, I think I've seen my friends do that before. So, I mean, why not? Maybe <laughs> once I move out. <laughs> when you are on holiday, do you prefer to send postcards or do you prefer to take photos and send them to people? I've never done the postcards thing before. I feel like it's kind of outdated, but I wouldn't mind doing that or start doing that in my vacations. But I usually just take photos and send it on WhatsApp. Let's say my family group, I send it just to show them like what I've been up to in my vacation. So yeah, just photos. I would like to talk about uh, the author or the writer that I would like to meet uh, in the future. Um, unfortunately, she passed away, but um, the writer is Jane Austen. She is the writer of Pride and Prejudice, uh, which is the current read that I'm uh, reading right now. The reason why I would like to meet her is because of how um, during her time, which is around 1700s um, or 1800s, I was always interested in like the Victorian or like um, how they were in the past, um, the way they dress, the way they talk, uh, especially because um, people in the past spoke differently, like the language or the um, words that they used were very different. Right now, I'm reading one of her books, Pride and Prejudice, and sometimes I have to um, Google what she's saying. Like, I don't understand what she wrote. It's very interesting the way she writes or like the language that she uses describing her, like the setting, the story setting. I really enjoy it. And um, I would like to find out about her lifestyle specifically because... Again, I'm just very interested or intrigued about the idea of like living in uh, that era of where um, the time that she was still alive. Why I would like to meet her is because I'm, again, very interested in how she speaks or how she uh, spoke um, and the language or uh, language that she uses. Okay, well done. That's the end of the two minutes. So we've been talking about a writer that you would like to meet and we're going to continue to talk about reading in section three. What kind of books are most popular with children in your country? To thank you for watching this video, I want to give you a free course that has helped thousands of students improve their IELTS speaking score. What it's going to do is take you through every single part of the test and give you strategies for part one, part two and part three and also allow you to practice at home for free and get feedback. To sign up for that for free, all you have to do is just click the link in the description. Thanks very much and let's get back to the video. In my country, to be honest, I'm unaware of. I don't know that much, but when I was a kid, I used to like 
Dr. Seuss. Even now, sometimes if I see Dr. Seuss online, I would I would just skim through it because I like how um, it rhymes. It was just fun to read, to be honest. Why do you think that some children don't read very often? So I, I'm a firm believer in, in terms of how parents um, reinforce their children. So when it comes to... Like I've seen, I've personally seen how parents act uh, with their children, um, giving them iPads or <laughs> like just letting them watch TV. So I believe that if parents uh, enforce their children to read more books or encourage them to start reading together, that would be a fun exercise to do at home. Other than that, I feel like the parents are usually the biggest reinforcers. Now let's talk about reading for different purposes. Do you think that speed reading is a useful skill to have? I do think that it is a useful skill. So for me, I I read really slow. Like sometimes I have to reread um, a paragraph because it, I couldn't just decipher what it was saying. So I feel like in terms of um, like high demand jobs where they need to get a lot of things done on time. So speed reading could be a useful skill. Some people believe that reading novels is more interesting or more enjoyable than reading nonfiction. Why do you think that is? So I feel like reading just generally could give you a time out from everything. I would understand why people would prefer fiction over nonfiction because just in your daily life, you're experiencing a lot of, you know, draining um, energies around you. So when it comes to your alone reading time, you get to experience or I guess be creative in your imagination. So, yeah, that's why I think um, fiction books are more popular. Recently, many bookshops have had to close because of competition from online bookstores. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I think that it's a bad thing because I personally love um, when I physically go to the store and look through the books and just read or because I feel like buying a book should feel like an experience rather than like a chore um, so buying it online dim diminishes that experience, uh, overall. So yeah, I feel like it is a bad thing, um, that the physical stores are closing and online stores are overtaking. Let me give you some feedback on your performance. So you're hoping to get a, a band nine and I'll go through the four marking criteria. So pronunciation, fluency and coherence, grammar and vocabulary. So let's start off with your pronunciation. To thank you for making it this far in the video, I want to give you 10% off our VIP course. The IELTS VIP course is the most successful IELTS course in the world. That is a fact because we have more band seven, eight and nine success stories than any other IELTS course in the entire world. We do that by simplifying the whole IELTS process, supporting you with some of the best IELTS teachers in the world and being with you every step of the way until you get the score that you need. All you have to do is just look down in the description, just click that and you can sign up. If you have any questions about the VIP course, always feel free to get in touch with us. We answer 100% of the questions that we get. Hope that you have become a VIP. If not, enjoy the rest of this free video. The examiner will be thinking about two things. One will be clarity. Can he or she understand everything that you're saying? And I can understand 100% of what you're saying. Every word, every syllable is extremely clear. The examiner is not really thinking about accents or anything like that. What they're thinking about is, do I understand you? I can understand you 100%. So that's excellent. The examiner will also think about higher level pronunciation features such as intonation. Intonation is when our voice goes up and our voice goes down. We use that to convey meaning and you do that very, very naturally. You also use connected speech and sentence stress and word stress very, very well. So good start with the, with the pronunciation. Let's move on to fluency and coherence. Coherence is, did you answer the question? 
And did you develop your answers enough? Did you give enough information and really dive into the topic? For part one, you really did. You nailed every single question. You answered it um, appropriately. Um, you developed it enough. Um, part two, you were talking about Jane Austen. You would be fine for this one. It was describe a writer you would like to meet. Hypothetically, we could meet someone who has passed away. Just be very careful on test day. Make sure that you're really, really focusing in on that topic. For that one, I don't think any examiner would say, oh, you can't meet Jane Austen, so let, let's mark you down. Because it's, it's kind of one of those questions, who would you like to meet, alive or dead? So you would be fine, but just be careful on, on test day. Part three, you did answer each question. However, you could have shown the other side of some of the things. Um, so, you, for example, why do you think some children don't read books very often? So you said it's because of the parents. Are there any other sides to that? Is it because of maybe you could talk about children? Maybe they're distracted with other things. You did mention that. I'm being overly critical just to, to make sure that you do get the, the highest mark. But also some of the other questions, you know, could you have shown the other side of, of, of the argument? Could you maybe have um, thought of different ideas and explored different ideas the way that you did answer it, I think would be absolutely fine. But on test day, towards the end of the test, students are often tired, stressed. They just want it to be over. And on test day, you might just pick, a, pick an answer, pick an idea, answer it quite quickly without really knowing that you're answering it quickly. And then if you do that for all questions in part three, it could affect your score. For this one, I don't think it did. I'm just being really, really cautious. A good way to answer those questions is, okay, what do I think? What would someone who disagrees with me think? Explore the, the topic a little bit more, if you can. You don't have to do it for every answer, because what will happen is if you try to think too much, it could affect your fluency. So you could be like, uh, mm, I don't know. And then that will affect your fluency a little bit. Um, overall, your fluency was excellent. In part three, you could tell when you were thinking. Generally, when people pause and hesitate a little bit, it's because they're thinking a lot more. But you were only thinking about the next idea. You weren't thinking about vocabulary or grammar or which tense am I using or what's a better adjective to use. If you were doing that quite a lot, it would lower your score. But the examiner recognizes that you're not looking for language. You're not looking for English. You're just thinking about the next idea. And you did, you were like, like, I know, you know, mm, at times, but that's quite natural. The way you did it was very natural. If you and I were speak, having a normal conversation, you would hear me doing that sometimes. So it's, the examiner isn't looking for perfection. They're looking for, you know, if you went to university in an English speaking country or you started working in New York or Sydney, would you be able to interact with people and sound natural? And, and you, you would. Your grammar is excellent and um, you have a massive range of grammar. You can talk about any topic and um, you also do that very accurately. You did make a couple of little tiny, tiny slips like prepositions. And um, I think you said in holiday instead of on holiday, for example. Um, but native English speakers do that all the time. You can actually make these tiny little slips and still get one of the the higher bands because it is a reflection of the fact that native English speakers, in, including me, who is an English teacher, I make little grammar slips from time to time when I'm speaking. I used some really, really high level vocabulary like this. So this demonstrates that, you know, we, we asked you about a range of different topics and you had enough vocabulary to discuss any of those topics. And all of your vocabulary was very, very accurate and you were using great topic specific vocabulary, idiomatic vocabulary. It's like speaking to a native English speaker. So you would get a band nine. Well done. And yeah, I've every faith that you would, if you did the real test, you would get the highest score. Well done. Thank you.